I will speak about um, reconstructing functions in high dimensions using compressive sensing. So um, I apologize that, well, maybe some of you have seen this because it's not brand new, but I thought it's the best fit, at least to the title of this workshop. Um, but maybe, um, well, there's still something interesting for you. So, um, so we, we consider uh, functions, um, let's say, complex valued or real valued, um, and omega is in a subset of Rd, and D uh, rather large. And, um, well, with arbitrary omega, it's maybe quite difficult, so, so we assume some tensor product structure. So let's say, for simplicity, uh, something like uh, minus 1, 1 uh, to the d. Could also be 0, 1 to the d or rd. And so, um, So we would like to reconstruct f from samples. So classical problem. Um, but d is large, so um, there is one important challenge. Um, well, because uh, there is a so-called curse of dimensionality. Uh, so we, which we would like to avoid. So let me give you one uh, result, which was actually briefly mentioned by Wolfgang yesterday. Um, so which is due to uh, uh, Novak and Wozniakowski uh, from 2009. Um, so we consider the following set of functions. Uh, so C infinity functions on, well, okay, let's say, uh, I think they formulated for 0, 1D, but well, it's also fine for minus 1D, one, one and um, such that all derivatives um, are bounded by 1 in L infinity, so for all alpha so for all multi-indices. So very smooth uh, set of functions. So classically, you would say that's very easy to, to approximate or to reconstruct using samples. But um, in high dimensions, the following happens. So let's, let's consider some set of uh, samples. Um, and so, and, and the idea is to, to try to reconstruct f from samples on, on, uh, yeah, on these points. And so, and in order to reconstruct, well, we need, need, need an operator which goes, takes these samples and goes back into the function space. Um, um, let's call it a reconstruction operator, so, so that R can even be nonlinear, so a anything. Um, construction operator. Um, so, yeah, possibly nonlinear. And now suppose. Um, So the worst case error that we make by trying to reconstruct, so we, we take samples on, on these points x, j, and then get this vector of samples and apply the reconstruction operator to this. And, um, well, 
if, if the supremum is less than one. So, of course, I can easily produce an error of one simply by approximating with the zero function. So, this I can even do with no sample at all. But um, so, so, to get a non-trivial non, uh, non reconstruction error requires that, um, that the number of samples is larger than 2 to the um, floor of d over 2. So, in order to get a non-trivial reconstruction error, you need at least an exponential number of, of, of points. So, and, and obviously, well, the function is as smooth, uh, the function class consists of really smooth functions. So, so smoothness doesn't help at all to avoid the curse of dimension. Um, and, and by the way, we are not speaking about rates and so on. I mean, you still have these rates, but they only kick in, uh, well, obviously after you, you go beyond this point. Um, so, which means that the constants scale exponential. So, in order to, to avoid um, um, the curse of dimension, uh, smoothness alone doesn't set, uh, I mean, it's not sufficient. So, we, we need to, to impose more conditions. Like, uh, so, here's the worst case error over all functions in here. And so, what we w would need to do is, is like, uh, make, make, get a smaller class or, well, or a different class. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, okay, this means uh, if you take alpha to be zero, that the, the L infinity t, uh, norm of all the functions is, is, is one. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, here is less than one. What do you mean? No, I mean, if, if you approximate, if, if R is the zero operator, then you get, get, get the one here. And so you want, want the error which is less than one, and once you, uh, well, you, you mean there should be one minus epsilon or something, or? or? Well, I looked it up yesterday, and I think. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. Okay. So, if you would like to avoid the curse of dimension, uh, the, the message is that we need to uh, make further assumption in addition to, um, or well, in replacement of, of smoothness. And so we need, uh, yeah, some sort of structural assumptions, like some sparsity assumptions. Uh, yesterday we've seen that that. Um, low rank tensor approximations may, may be one way of doing this, and, and here we would like to do this using um, sparsity in a, in a certain basis. Um, and um, in order to make things a little simpler or, or sort of manageable, we, we assume that, that um, the basis that we consider it has a tensor product structure. Um, so we start um, with functions in one dimension. Uh, well, let's let's say n is some index set. Yeah. So. Let's say n zero or, or z, and um, uh, so orthonormal with respect to 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 some probability measure mu on minus one one. Um, yeah, so, so phi k, uh, t phi j, uh, 
Okay, and now with this, this one-dimensional basis, uh, we construct a tensor product basis. Uh, so we say psi nu, nu of x is uh, phi nu j of x j. So nu is, is like a multi-index. And um, that's uh, also normal with respect to, um, let's call it omega. Uh, so that's mu tensor mu. So they're the factors. Okay, so so um, yeah, we do this in order to have like a tensor product structure also on the on the index set. And um, the ma main examples you should think about are the following. Um, So uh, one is Fourier, so phi k of t equals pi i k t. Um, so recall that t was between minus one, one. That's why there is no two here. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this happens if you don't call your wife in the morning. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. And and you uh, is the normalized uh, Lebesgue measure and. Uh, on minus one one. Okay, then of course these functions are also normal, and the tensor product. If we form the tensor product, we get get the standard. And uh, yeah, the standard multivariate uh, Fourier basis. And uh, omega is one. So the, the normalized Lebesgue measure on, on minus one, one D. So that's one example. Um, another example uh, would be like um, Chebyshev polynomials. So in 1D, and then you tensorize them to get a tensorized Chebyshev polynomial basis. Um, uh, here, you have a different measure uh, than the standard Lebesgue measure, but yeah. But of course, you can also think of, of other examples. And OK, and now, um, we. Um, Let's say, uh, yeah. So now let's stick to this example. Um, so we, we expand some function now into into this this uh, basis. Um, 
And, and the idea is now to impose some sparsity conditions on uh, CNU. And, and um, the thing is, well, how do you do this if you're in high dimension? Uh, so that in the end, we avoid the curse of dimensionality. Um, Okay, so, I mean, there are several ways of, of how one can do this. So, let's say um, we look at, uh, well, the following scenario. One, actually, I will spend most of the talk on this and only, if there is time enough, uh, briefly mention a second way of doing it. Um, so, the idea is, uh, to start with, with uh, weighted uh, anisotropic uh, uh, spaces, uh, which we call A alpha, uh, with norm um, so it's So we, we use a, a weighted L1 norm. Okay, so, um, and let's call this weight be new and the corresponding sp uh, and let's introduce a which is the the standard space where we just take all these indices to be zero which reduces to the to the Fourier algebra and uh, so what's the idea here um, like now um, if there is an exponent alpha one, like in direction uh, one, you basically have um, like smoothness uh, of alpha one in, in direction one and, and alpha two in direction two. And, and now the idea is, is if we want to get, get tractable reconstruction, uh, the idea is to, to assume that in most direction the function is very smooth. So think of being constant, uh, so that, that in, in um, that, in effect, the function mostly depends on, on a small number of, of variables. So, so this can be modeled with this, this, this alpha. And so, so what we assume is that if we take the, uh, the, inver uh, the sum of these inverses, that this is uh, at some, some parameter 1 over r. And Ideally, R shouldn't depend on D, which, which basically means that um, uh, yeah, most, of, uh, most of the alpha E's are, are really large, so we have, have high smoothness in, in these directions. And only for a small number of them, uh, we, we, we can allow that there is actually dependence of the function, yeah, this variable. And OK, one, and, and now. Uh, we want to do sparse uh, uh, approximation, so we, we um, uh, basically would like to pick an index um, uh, out of this, okay, that's actually and to the D, um, so that we approximate a given function with an expansion where we restrict the indices to some, some support set. And what we do, we simply take uh, such rectangles Okay, if, if uh, the index uh, set runs only, is, is n0, so runs from 0 to infinity, then, uh, I mean, you re have to replace the minus n1 by 0, but, but I hope that's, that this point is clear. And, okay, so let's do this and see um, what, what, what approximation we error we can get. Um, so 
Um, so we look at a finite expansion nu in S, C nu, um, psi nu, and try to approximate a given function, uh, which well, is of this form. So And, okay, we actually measure the error in, in A, uh, so which means we me take the L1 norm of C nu, but uh, I mean, for, for the Fourier system, you can uh, estimate the L infinity error by the error in A, so, so this is something reasonable to do. Um, and so, uh, well, the best thing we can do is certainly, well, uh, we write f in this form and then choose as coefficients uh, the, the expansion coefficients of C nu. And so, so the error we, we get uh, is, is the sum of the coefficients uh, outside S. And, and now there is a simple trick. Um, so, okay, I'm not actually sure whether I really need to. So we multiply with the inverse of this, this weight and the weight itself, and then this is bounded by the maximum of mu outside S of this inverse. What? What the infinity norm? A, a is this norm. So it's uh, a is is the norm uh, where the weight is 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 constant one. So it's the Fourier algebra norm. And and if you wish, you can estimate the L infinity norm by the uh, by the a norm. So so. Uh, we could start actually with the L infinity norm if, if you wish. So, and then, uh, um, and then uh, we can bound this certainly by the term where we sum over everything. And, and uh, so this is, uh, yeah, okay. And, and now S has, has this form and, and uh, the weights have this form. So um, you, you maximize this if you take the, the, the smallest possible new one outside this, this, uh, this rectangle. So you, you can, can bound this by um, basically one plus and one to the alpha one plus n2 to the alpha 2 and and then here you have the norm in a alpha yeah to the minus 1 of course that's important <laughs> um, yes and um, okay and now uh, we have haven't said yet like how we choose these these ends so in the end we would like that um, the cardinality of S is, is basically, let's say, uh, a sparsity S. So, yeah, the cardinality is, well, okay, it's basically a product of these ends. Uh, and, um, and, but we want to choose it in a way that this gets uh, as small as possible. Uh, and so it turns out, um, uh, okay, so, we choose basically, okay, the, the cardinality is basically the product of these, uh, these numbers here, um, and we choose it in a way that this is s to the r divided by alpha i. 
and um, and then okay, so that's how we choose it, and then we get um, uh, okay, so these cancel, so so we basically uh, get one plus d times um, s to the r to the minus one. And this is less than d to the minus one, s to the minus r. Okay, so so the 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 r is is basically um, the the rate that we get. And okay, uh, the fact that d actually appears with a minus one well even helps you. Uh, but and. Okay, and the product, um, well, the cardinality of S is the product uh, of 1 plus 2 Ni's, and um, that's basically S to the R divided by alpha I's, and uh, so that's S is the sum of the one over the alpha i's, and now you see why we made this choice. Um, uh, that's 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 giving us s. So we get an s uh, s sparse expansion um, or an s sparse approximation uh, with uh, giving us this rate if we are in a alpha. Okay. And uh, yeah, as I said, this basically means that the function mostly depends on a yeah, small number of, of variables. Um, and in, in most variables, it's, it's very smooth, like think of being a constant. And but OK, but what's the problem here? Uh, well, in practice, um, well, we, we, well, well, we said we're working in this function space, but if, if we don't know much about the function, I mean, what, what alpha should we choose? And, and so the idea is now that um, we don't assume to know alpha, but we, we assume that the function is a union in, in the union of all spaces A alpha, where alpha satisfies this condition. Uh, which basically, if you think of being the function depending only on a small number of variables, um, means that we don't know which variables these are. We just know that it's a small number. Um, so, so we assume that um, that f is in this union. So this is. Well, a non-standard way of, of modeling things, because you usually, in approximation theory, you start, well, let's suppose f is in A alpha, but not in the union of, of spaces. So, um, OK. OK, but, um, well, one point is, of course, if we know A alpha, then uh, it's clear what we need to choose as, as like this ansatz uh, S, so the support set. And the usual idea in compressive sensing is that we don't know the support set. So let's see uh, which support sets we can get. Um, so let's introduce a set of support sets. Um, so let's okay. Let's work in CD for so simplicity. Uh, and D and D and um, the cardinality of these these high-dimensional rectangles should be less than S. Um, so I allow all, all rectangles that, like, I mean, they, they can be, like, extended like this or, or like, like this. It's just that the uh, cardinality of indices in there should be smaller than S. And 
Um, and then we can also, uh, well, okay, let's, let's give this a name. Um, so this unit spaces, call it XR. So it's not, not a linear space itself. Um, um, approximation error. So we introduce a quantity, let's call it sigma ms, f, and we measure the error in, in a. Um, that's the infimum overall coefficient sequences with the support set being an element in ms. Okay, so uh, maybe the difference to standard compressive sensing is that I do not allow all possible S sparse supports, but, but only those uh, that are contained in this, this, this set here. And uh, what, what we have just derived um, is... Now we measure the error in A, um, so I mean the, this A just refers to the error in, uh, in which at uh, the norm in which we measure error. Yeah, I mean, if you wish, you could also put the L infinity norm or, or, or something else. Although it's most convenient to work with with A in the context. No, no, the, the A is the one where, where uh, the, the weight is, is one. No, 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 A is for alpha equals uh, just the vector of indices zero. So you just get the, yeah, so the, the, the A without index is just uh, the standard Fourier algebra norm. And okay, so by what we have just derived is that we can bound this error by this, so we have this rate s to the minus r, this is what we did here. And um, so f is in, in this union, so we just choose, the, choose an alpha for which this is contained in. And so, so we, uh, we get actually that this is, uh, and uh, yeah, the constant we get is the, the minimum overall um, these a alpha norms. So, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, and now uh, if you would like to reconstruct. Um, okay, so that's, that's the general rate we can get if we do an s sparse expansion. But now we want to realize this, this rate just uh, knowing sample values. So we want to uh, get, a, uh, get a reconstruction method and a bound that, that scales in this, in this way. So, um, um, okay, so the reconstruction method doesn't, doesn't, of course, doesn't know the ideal S, but it knows that it's some S in here. Um, so it's convenient to consider the union of, of all these supports. Um, and this, this is giving, um, okay, let's, so we take all S in this set MS and union over S. And um, I guess many people have seen this, this is actually hyperbolic cross, so um, if you look at this, uh, this condition here, it's basically the condition that this product 1 plus uh, 2 and i uh, is less than s, and so we want all indices that satisfy this, and, and, 
And so the union here gives, gives a hyperbolic cross. And what we will later need is um, that we have a bound, so we can bound this by a constant. So the first expression may be well known. So it's basically s times log d to the minus 1 s, but uh, this is not the one that will be useful for us. One can also um, estimate this by s to the 2 plus log d. So that the d doesn't ex appear in an exponent, but just with a logarithm, so that that will be important later. Okay, and now, uh, okay, and so, so what one actually does is, is uh, as, as possible index indices for, for the expansion, one now chooses all indices in here, and in the end, one chooses some uh, support set that is contained in the hyperbolic cross. Uh, it may be a different one than, than all these rectangles, but, but in the end, the error can just get better if we allow, have a bit more flexibility. Um, so so that's, that's the idea. And okay, now, uh, now we are given sample values. And um, so the idea is to compute. Um, um, these and then basically approximate f with so okay one thing one could do now is well we count the indices here so so we take a number of samples that is basically um, well, at least the size of HS D, and then uh, we should be able to, to reconstruct. But um, but but the trouble is uh, okay. So so we, ideally, we would like to have a number of samples that is linear in the number of degrees of freedom, perhaps up to some logarithmic uh, factors, but avoiding. Um, the curse of dimension, like the scaling with d. So if we just take this number, uh, like this d kills us. And and this one is, of course, well, you might take this number, but then maybe you're better here, but this is certainly not linear in S. Um, okay, and so what we do is uh, exp uh, um, use ideas from compressive sensing. Um, so um, here we introduce a so-called sampling matrix. Um, so we, we take this as entries, the, the system evaluated at these points. So that's um, an M times N matrix, and, and N equals the cardinality of HSD. And um, yeah, I didn't say anything yet, um, but this is coming in the next uh, theory. So if you have seen a bit about compressed sensing, um, I mean, usually in order to prove guarantees, you need some randomness. So what we do, we choose these at random, these points. Uh, I mean, we have a probability measure. Um, for which the system is also orthogonal, and we use that probability measure to select the points uh, in it independently at random. So, okay. So, so here's the theorem we, we use. I mean, this was the first version was proved by Candes and Tau, and then like improved in terms of the logarithmic factors throughout the years. Um, so, okay, uh, well, okay, let's, let's, now, gamma is an arbitrary index set, uh, but let's say, think of gamma being HD, and 
So we look at the L infinity norm of these psi j's, and k is the maximum over this, and, and imagine k to be small, and that's why the Fourier system is ideal, because then k is 1. So k 1 is the smallest possible value. And, and select x1 to xm iid at random. according to this probability measure. And now the, the crucial um, yeah, let's write it like this. Uh, so C k squared um, S and then we have two log factors in S, one in N, and then there's also term, um, well, depending on the probability. Um, so then with probability at least one minus epsilon um, well, well, then if you know what it is, uh, uh, A satisfies the, the restricted isometry property. But let's give exactly uh, give immediately the consequence of this. Uh, so every um, let's say G. Um, So if we okay here we take an expansion that just lives on on you now this this finite index set um, can from uh, samples y j equals g of x j and we allow a bit of noise where we ah well epsilon was bad let's take um, uh, eta j square root of m times um, tau say so So we do reconstruction via L1 minimization. Um, so subject to um, y minus ad less or equal to square root of m times tau. Um, with error. Um, So this is, yeah, the one norm on the coefficient level, but if we go to the function level, it's again the A norm. Um, and here we have, well, okay, let's say the, the error of best, well, okay, let's write it directly like this because, um, well, of, of this, this, uh, well, okay, like right direct A, and then we get a term uh, which depends on on the error that we make here. Okay, um, yeah. So if you get samples, um, well, choose them at randomly. We have this condition here, and the number of samples skates like this. So the basic point is that it skates linear in S, then we get, get reconstruction. Um, well, we could, of course, also replace this by G minus the corresponding re reconstruction in, in the A norm. Okay, so, so that's nice, but, and okay, let's, let's 
just for a second look at how many samples we need in the end if, if we take the, so n is the, um, the cardinality of this. So if we plug in uh, that estimate here, um, so we get uh, that m should scale like, uh, and k is, let's say, uh, one, uh, then, and well, we just choose, well, epsilon to do 10 to the minus six or something, then we get s uh, log square s, and here, um, let's choose this term here, so we have two uh, s to two plus log d, and so um, this is s log d log to the three s. So we get only a logarithmic scaling in d, which uh, certainly means that we avoided the curse of dimension. And and so finally, what we need to do. Um, now, well, now we assumed we are already on this hyperbolic cross, but in the end, we would like to take f from this union of spaces, so which is an infinite dimensional uh, space. Um, so we do infinite dimensional compressed sensing, if you wish to call it like that. Um, and so, so the idea is, if you start with an f there, you, um, so now, okay, so now f is in xr, and we get samples fj, f of xj. Um, so the idea is now to choose some um, s prime, so that uh, we, we work on the approximate first on the corresponding hyperbolic cross. Um, so, we write this as f of xj plus, uh, plus, no, uh, okay. Uh, so, we, we replace f by the approximation, uh, f tilde, and f tilde, um, And you, so S prime might be slightly larger than S, but, but it's still, still finite. And then um, epsilon j, um, well, that's uh, less than the, the L infinity norm of F minus F tilde, which is less than, um, yeah, if you have this, this, say, the Fourier system or, or some, some bounded, the normal system, we, um, we get f minus f tilde in the A norm, and now if, if f is in that space, we get that this is, uh, let's say, s prime, and then here the minimum over all these uh, f alphas, so we can use use these spaces to, to say something about the error that we make in the samples if we replace f by the, the approximation. And, and in the end, um, well, I'm running out of time. Uh, we use that result with, with this bound on the, uh, on the eta j's, say, and, and plug everything together. And, and so one thing uh, one has to do to be careful is that, okay, the tau we get is basically this bound here, but we multiply by square root of s. So in the end, we need to choose an s prime um, so that, uh, well, okay, let's, let's see. So, so f minus the reconstruction, uh, we, we write as f minus f tilde, the r norm plus f tilde minus the reconstruction, so, so here we get basically this, this rate with the corresponding s and not the s prime, and in order to balance the two terms, we need to choose uh, 
an S prime, um, so that S prime to the minus R times square root of S is S to the minus R, and, and, and if, if, if we do this, uh, we see that we need to choose, um, uh, so S prime equals S to the one plus two, two over R, and, and, and then in the end we get, uh, get an error rate of, um, well, of, of C S to the minus R, uh, this minimum over these norms, and for a number of samples that scales like, um, yeah, basically C uh, K squared one plus two over R log D, uh, well, here's an S log D log to the three S. Okay, and as you see, then the uh, dependence in D is only logarithmic. Um, and we get the de desired rate, uh, not knowing the, the, the actual A alpha in which we are, just uh, knowing that we are in the union of these A alphas. Um, okay, I had a second scenario which, which assumes like um, an a weighted um, LP norm with P less than one and some tensor product structure on these uh, uh, W nu's, uh, which basically is motivated by a problem in uncertainty quantification, but um, okay, I'll, I'll skip that second scenario. So thanks very much for your attention. Maybe I'm <clears throat> missing something uh, simple, but I see you avoid the curse of dimensionality in the number of samples. Yeah, but well, well, I you, didn't speak about the, the when computation When you do the recovery time. in the computation, it fully hits you because you have to touch a matrix with uh, big N columns. So how can you ever do the recovery without... Yeah, okay. Uh, I agree that uh, the number of computations you need to do is still there. That's true, but if the main, uh, main bottleneck is the number of samples, uh, uh, I mean, that's, 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 that's the idea, but, but I certainly agree that, that uh, this may be relevant uh, also. Um, but li like if, if, if the taking number of samples is, is like uh, a factor 10 to the 6 more expensive than doing computations, then um, yeah. So, uh, the restriction to the hyperbolic cross <coughs> relative to union of subspaces, which you usually have in compressed sensing, is that uh, conceptually relevant or is this done for sake of exposition? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's not really a union of subspaces. No, it's I not. take this union of indices and then, right. then I get the hyperbolic yes. cross. Of course, in the hyperbolic cross, you have, you have more sets of cardinality S mm -hmm. than, than the yeah. things you start with. But, okay, but maybe okay, so I didn't get the actual question. I mean, fundamentally, you would like to have some low-dimensional structure embedded in your ambient space, right? So here, the choice you made was union of subspaces in principle. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So, um, okay but not quite, you, know, you look at the hyperbolic cross, so why not work with union of subspaces? Plain. Um, I mean, in, in some sense, the idea was to, to, I mean, we have this tensor product structure on the domain and therefore and also on the coefficient uh, set, yeah. and, and in this way, uh, I you mean, mentioned. the hyperbolic yeah. cross appears naturally, right. but okay. I, 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 mean, I mean, in principle, this idea, uh, that you, you use these compressed sensing ideas in, in like infinite dimensions. I mean, you first truncate to a finite uh, dimensional space and, and, and basically in a way so that you can ensure a certain error uh, um, for, for the, the approximation. 
uh, and then do a sparse approximation inside. So, so that finite dimensional approximation can be way larger than, than the, the sparsity that you aim for. But I mean, that, I think it's a general idea. But of course, you can play around with this concept. It was just one way of, 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 of doing that. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, in, in a way, what is the level of, uh, say, universality in all this? You, you do pick S, right? Uh, sorry? Um, the level of universality. So you do not know in which class of that union the mm -hmm. target function belongs to, but you do pick S. So um, in, in, in what sense can... To what extent can you make the result independent of a priori knowledge, which in practice you may not have. That's, that's what I'm saying. Well, you can view it also in that way, um, that you say, uh, well, you don't know S, but you may know the number of samples that you have. Yeah. And then, uh, I mean, you can, can well, you sim simply solve for the S, which is the maximum S that still satisfies it. Okay, practice you still don't know the constant, but let's say uh, you don't. Um, and, and then you apply that result, and then you get an error wi which, um, scales like uh, s some constants that depend on f uh, times this s to the minus r, where s now depends on this, this m. So you get, get a rate in terms of the number of samples, actually. So you can reformulate this. Uh, um, so, so instead, where do I have it? Um, yeah, here. So instead of, you can s replace s by basically m divided by three log log to the 3m and then, and then get, get this here. And this doesn't, then you don't need to know an s. Uh, but, well, usually if you run the algorithm, you know what your m is. Uh, um, and, and by the way, uh, so you can actually enlarge uh, here and define an approximation space, which is not really a space, which basically uh, you pick all functions for, for, for which this decays like s to the minus r, this is really a space, and then this union of A alpha is contained in there, but while well, getting a concrete description of, of this approximation space is some, something else. And, and okay, maybe one, one further point. Uh, so the second scenario that I didn't talk about, I mean, here you really also don't have this um, uh, curse of dimension in terms of the computation, but, but well, basically, the idea is you pick, pick the, the, the weights in a way that this works out nicely. Okay. One further. Uh, is it fair to say that you, in the end, have to get about obviously either space and justify the hyperbolic cross smooth the space and do the, the theorem there and say that all these A alpha spaces are embedded into this form? You, you know, you can write the norm not in this form, but write it as a product. And then you have a standard. And then you work with this one space and you prove the theorem. And you say a lot of functions are there. And my impression is that you need much more samples than. Um, I see only that in the sampling part, you only work with the hyperbolic cross. Um, <laughs> yeah, but. <laughs> But, no, 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 but, but okay, the, the idea of compressive sensing is that we pick, pick a set of sparsity S out of uh, the hyperbolic cross uh, and, and then do approximation on the sub... I mean, the hyperbolic cross itself is much larger, has a cardinality much larger than S. And so, um, I mean, you still need some sparsity concept. Uh, and so if you just work with one space, um, okay, you can... That, that's the other idea you... you Yeah, okay, the, the, the argument is, well, you, you might not pick actually one of these S's, 
but, uh, but if you pick another one, you know that the error is at most the one uh, that you get by picking a rectangle. And, and okay. I, I, I roughly understand where you w want to aim at, but I don't think it works. Uh, so, um, but we can discuss offline. Well.